Okay, well, Robert's uh, getting connected. I'll begin the session since we're already a few minutes behind. I know it's the end of the day, and we've got birds of feather sessions and people's you know, lives to get back to. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I have an honor today to be moderating this panel of a number of the leading innovators around savings-led financial inclusion. So on the call today, who I'm going to you know, have themselves more properly introduce themselves are Sophie Blockstead from Hive Online, as well as Wes Watson from Dream Start Labs, and Robert Timmer, who will be joining us soon as a speaker from Cardano Development. So in terms of the format of today's panel, we're going to allow each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and the organization and what they're doing around digitizing savings web financial inclusion. And then I ask if you have any questions throughout the panel to type them in the chat or the Q&A session, and we'll reserve a few minutes at the end to cover those questions. So let me pass it on to Wes, who's going to introduce himself briefly. So we'll just skip through these slides for a sense of time. OK, Wes, I'll let you take it away in introducing Dream Start Labs. All right, sure. Thanks, Ed. So um, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, Dream Start Labs is a social impact uh, fintech. Uh, we are in the savings-led um, uh, digital finance space. Our flagship product is uh, uh, an app called Dream Save. Uh, we bill as the uh, smart, fun, easy way to manage savings groups. So it really focuses on the informal community banking uh, sector uh, and helps um, unbanked people in the developing world and emerging markets uh, build savings, uh, access loans, and achieve their financial goals. Uh, we also have a companion product on the next slide uh, called DreamSave Insights. Uh, and DreamSave Insights uh, collects data uh, from the, the savings groups in the field and allows um, uh, partner organizations that are working with uh, these groups uh, to, um, to identify trends uh, in the data and help support them better. This is primarily used uh, by NGOs, government actors, um, uh, et cetera. Um, the target market uh, is what we consider informal community banking. So uh, this is really the savings group um, market that you'll see throughout uh, the world. Um, we, we look at uh, kind of the, the 3 billion um, uh, folks um, that are uh, classically unbanked or underbanked in the world. And regardless of where, where you uh, go in emerging markets, Africa, Asia, uh, throughout Latin America, uh, you'll see in the next slide uh, groups that look a lot like this, where basically um, uh, getting together and uh, they form uh, their own their own savings and loan association, uh, set their own policies, set interest terms, uh, and get together on a regular basis to, uh, to contribute savings to the group, build savings to achieve uh, their goals. Uh, they uh, uh, access loans from a central investment fund in the group uh, and then use those funds to, uh, to grow their small businesses and micro uh, enterprises. Uh, the interest from those uh, savings or from those uh, loans then go back into the group as shared profits. So this is a, a phenomenal model that uh, not only gives uh, sort of the, 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 the two, three billion folks in the world who have very limited access to even, uh, in many cases, traditional microfinance, gives them access to uh, capital for, uh, for small businesses, but also does it in a way uh, that can, it can grow and share profits uh, in, a, in a pretty substantial way. Uh, so if you flip to the next slide, um, uh, the architecture of our, um, of our solution uh, really has a few components. At the front end, what the clients see uh, is an Android app. So you'll see that kind of in the in the first build uh, here. Uh, every group has at least one shared smartphone uh, that they use to to manage the group, to set all their policies. Behind that is a synchronization engine. The app core app runs offline because in many of these environments they do not have a, a stable internet connection. And every time uh, they we find a, a, a stable connection to a network, uh, we automatically and transparently back up the data. Behind that is a, a uh, an Apache database infrastructure that starts with Cassandra, highly scalable backend with uh, high write speeds that's uh, highly applicable for uh, a kind of a globally scalable environment, and then Apache Spark to do the, um, the big data analytics uh, for machine learning. Behind that, we have a second uh, database infrastructure that's based on Mongo, and this is really sort of for the, for the, the single view data to present it out to, uh, to our DreamSave Insights uh, data analytics backend, sort of separate the core operational data structure from the back end. And then all the core platform runs on the Google Cloud platform. So the, the back end infrastructure all the way down to the front end. So that's a quick uh, snapshot view of uh, DreamSave and what we're doing in this space. Ed? 
Yeah, thank you, Wes. We're looking forward to diving into more of your unique approach and some of what you've been able to achieve in digitizing savings groups. I'm going to pass it on to Sophie to talk a little bit about Hive Online. Thanks very much indeed, Ed. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sophie Blackstad, CEO of Hive Online. Um, <clears throat> we are approaching a similar market to, um, to Wes, but um, if we go on to the next slide, um, we, we approach um, more agricultural economies. Um, so we are very focused on the agricultural value chain um, and helping smallholder farmers get access to the things they need. Um, so we do community savings um, and lending. We do access to formal finance in, in, in very much the same way that Wes does. Um, but our, our, I think our target market is, is perhaps slightly more narrow than, than Wes's. is. Um, and the things that we do um, for this community um, is we, we use our technology to enable them to get access to the things that they need to smooth out their, um, their very bumpy uh, cash flow, um, which is one of the biggest challenges to building prosperity for smallholder farmers in Africa. Um, last year, 0.6% of smallholder farmers in Mozambique got access to lending, so we're very focused on, on helping farming communities get access to, to external lending. <clears throat> and as well as doing savings groups, we also work with agricultural cooperatives and farmers associations, um, and we see a kind of slow sliding scale between the the less formal savings groups and the more formalized cooperatives which also tend to be the, the bigger groups so we sort of cater to to the, the whole spectrum if we can move on to the next slide um, we do accounting and identity for all of our customers and they can share that between the, the, the different platforms um, as well as be, being able to store their Oh, we skipped a couple, I think, as well as being able to store their assets in, in their digital wallets. And the key thing here is that um, we give everyone a digital wallet on the blockchain, um, but they don't need a device to access it. So um, I think like, like Wes, is, it operates on a single device per group. Um, it operates largely offline um, so that we can um, we can sync to the um, to the blockchain and to the cloud when needed. Um, and it doesn't require all of the customers to have their own device. Um, we use social structures for authentication and validation to make sure that people aren't gaming the system. Um, and we also use, <clears throat> like likewise, we use um, rewards and, and just a certain level of gamification to encourage them to, um, to enter good data. Um, and on the last slide, if we can have a look at that, we, um, <clears throat> we use blockchain. Um, we're on the Stellar blockchain, um, which enables us to run very um, cheap, very fast transactions. Um, as I mentioned, we do have asynchronous updating so that we can manage with, um, with poor connectivity or no connectivity. Um, and we also have this suite, which includes dashboards for, um, for NGOs, but also for financial institutions, buyers, um, and really anyone else who's interested in the data. Um, we do maintain quite strict data standards, um, GDPR in particular, um, being a European organisation, um, and, and in fact most, um, we're, we're mostly focused on Africa, and most African countries have adopted some version of GDPR for, for data management. Um, we're also um, cloud-based and blockchain-based, but we, we operate microservices which talk to each other, um, and all of the front ends operate on the same back-end services. Um, so I think that's probably enough about us. Um, we are currently live in Mozambique, Zambia, Uganda, and just going into Nigeria and Kenya, and in Lebanon, which is not in Africa. There you go. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Wes. I think Robert is still trying to get his speaker access granted, so we'll let him give a more proper introduction to Cardano and what they're doing around digitizing the stock bells in South Africa through a microservices-based architecture as well. Robert, are you able to hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, yeah. Yeah, let me bring your slides up and then that's perfect timing. Sophie was just wrapping up her introduction. We'll let you uh, briefly introduce Cardano. So, okay, let me. Let yeah, me if you want to begin, I'll get the corresponding visual to match up to your audio. So, 
Okay, my, my name is Robert Timmer. I work for Cardano Development. Cardano Development is a Dutch foundation which is specialized in uh, developing financial products and risk management solutions to actually improve financial markets and make markets more sustainable. Uh, my specialty is actually working on savings. And, and rather similar than Sophie and Wes, we have been seeing uh, uh, the need for how can we actually digitize the, the existing savings behavior of people in uh, rural countries, but also sort of at the bottom of the pyramid. We see it as a necessity that people actually save uh, because it's all about financial inclusion and resilience. And where it's, uh, what we also see is that there's a high dependency in countries in Africa, but also in Asia of foreign debt financing to develop the economies. And what we see is that if we create the right structures, um, then that money, which is actually being saved now in cash, and most of the time being administered in a paper-based solution, can actually be invested in the economy, which is providing a benefit for the society, as well as a benefit benefit for the people, because then we can create an inflation in return. It's one of the many projects we do. Uh, so we work with majority development banks, NGOs, uh, and uh, family offices. We have quite a lot of financial products developed. So we do this for, uh, for instance, for currency hedging in, in all over Africa and in Asia. But we also do money market solutions and guarantees for infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. Ed. So the, the, the thing which is uh, not being shown is actually uh, where we see that, that, that triangle where we call where there's a bond between the uh, and the government and then making it possible to actually collect sufficient savings to actually also have a solution for the, the problem of old age poverty where we're all going towards where savings is actually the base of a way where people can actually collect sufficient money to actually have future income. Um, that's something additional what needs to be in place, which is currently not. And by digitizing the entire savings model, then we're actually getting towards something which is, is actually good for, uh, for people and society. From a technological part, we have been looking at what can we actually do um, to actually make sure that we protect people's data and at the same time create a very light link with the financial elements. Uh, but at the same time, create the financial elements and the financial transactions in such a way that we can work with assurance and actually meet international standards. So what we have done in South Africa together with NASASA is we actually set up um, a cooperative savings institution where we set up the cooperative savings institution, the financial institution separate of the management company. All the IT and all the services are in the management company, while all the money and the board of the, the cooperative financial institution is actually separate. For us, being in the management company, we actually focus on creating state-of-the-art technology so actually manage all the savings. We provide those, those savings to the financial institution at a very low fee so that we can prom promise people an, a return equal to inflation after fees. Um, and to make that possible, you're actually getting towards rather, to me, uh, very innovative parts. The first off is you actually have to be just as design conscious as, for instance, Apple. You have to work with people who don't have the means or the trust in working with technology or with financial institutions. And design is a great way to actually overcome that. At the other end, we have to look at how can we make it low cost possible while we also still have to deal with high numbers, high number of transactions with small amounts. Um, and you have to have a very good balance between efficiency and low cost, which is only possible if you invest sufficiently in the, in the beginning. Then you get towards the obstacle of KYC. Uh, there's very correct ways why we have KYC, while KYC, especially for people saving, is actually rather a burden. And if, if I look at it from a risk perspective, KYC is a rather ridiculous thing if you're just talking about savings because the risk, risk is rather at the client side than it is at the institution side, because in the end, the client is trusting you with their money and they will definitely come back to it. And the amounts of money are that small that you don't have to actually worry about money laundering. It will in the end, you need to comply, but it's a rather big headache for the client. Then you get towards data and hosting. Um, I think it's a very good thing, and so we already touched on it. GDPR and similar like frameworks have been introduced all over Africa and in Asia. But at the same time, it also creates the obstacle actually do local hosting. And if I look at local hosting, South Africa is rather well. 
But in many cases, in for instance, Kenya or when I worked in Ghana, you're actually getting in towards a, a troublesome area where you have to work with an offline and an online basis and where actually cloud hosting is rather expensive. So to actually overcome that, technology is a great way to actually solve it, but it is also a rather a big challenge for the simple reason that you have to have state-of-the-art technology at the lowest cost and then make it work. So for us, the open source community and actually making use of everything available through FinRect, working with all the microservices architecture, working with an entire member administration, which is also open source, also the microservices architecture, and even our app is microservices, uh, just simply makes it possible to actually deliver financial products for the lower end of the market. Ed. Okay, thank you, Robert. We're gonna get to having a vibrant discussion now amongst our panelists. And as I stated earlier, you know, they represent a good cross-section of different approaches and digitizing savings groups all around different regions of the world, but primarily with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm not sure, you know, the audience's knowledge and awareness of the savings led financial inclusion models. So I wanted to first kick off by having Sophie just talk a little bit around, you know, what is the primary model of a savings group and how does it differ from a more traditional microfinance or credit-based led approach to financial inclusion? And what really is it about this approach that makes them so effective for including the base of the pyramid and helping provide, you know, access to the ability to weather economic shocks and whatnot? So I'll so let you take that first question. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Ed. Um, so, yeah, what's the savings group? Well, uh, there's lots of different models of savings group, but they all fundamentally do the same thing. Um, and it's where a group of usually mostly women, um, about 20 to 30 people, meets on a regular basis, usually every week, um, and commits to putting a certain amount of money into a savings pot every week. Um, now, those amounts are usually very, very small. Um, and they're adjusted depending on the wealth of the group. So it tends to be people with the same general level of wealth. Um, and in, in different models, you can put different amounts in, but it's usually between one times and five times a certain amount that you can put in. Um, and then from this pot, um, that they can the group can borrow um, as individuals to um, to start businesses or to um, to cope with emergencies or for, for family reasons and things like that. Um, the, the groups are very strictly structured. Um, they have officers, um, usually a secretary, um, a, a chairperson and a treasurer. Um, and typically they put money into a lot metal box, box and each of these officers has a key to the box. Um, transactions can only happen in meetings um, and they're very strict about everyone turning up to meetings um, and paying fines if they're late and things like that. Um, so it's it's been enormously successful. Um, it's it's been an informal structure and it still is in many places um, for many many years. But um, Care International was the first to formalise this structure in the Village Savings and Loan Association model (VSLA) um, in Niger in 1991. Um, and following that, a lot of other NGOs have have kicked off their own models. So there's various different types, but they all fo follow the same fundamental format. And it enables the women and, and the men to um, to build a certain level of financial security, to build wealth internally within their communities without needing a bank. Um, but it's risky. Um, you know, there is theft, there is fraud, um, and um, there is also there are challenges with um, with accessing formal finance because although they're helping their own group to be more secure, um, it's it's difficult for them to use the records they've got on, on paper exercise books, which is how they keep their records before this, this technology came along. Um, so one of the transformational things about the technology is actually helping the women um, and the groups get access to, to formal finance by building a credit history. And that's something that every savings group app that I know does, <laughs> because it's just such a useful feature. Um, but in terms of the market, there's I, I estimate there's probably about 50, 000, sorry, 50 million of these groups in Africa, um, but nobody really knows. Thank you, Sophie. You that was a good comprehensive overview of the savings route model and then the overall size of the market, really what that potential for impact is. I know Sophie touched on a little bit, Wes, but could you dive into a little bit more of what are these benefits of digitization and what that can enable? And then also maybe you could speak because I know uh, Dream Start Labs has done some interesting studies around how you maintain the cohesion of the group when you're introducing all these digital tools, given the structures that Sophie discussed. So I'll let you talk a little bit about 
about that first. Sure, sure. So uh, really quickly, I mean, I think you could you could just maybe get a picture from what Sophie said um, of how challenging this would be. So it's a phenomenal model. But just imagine uh, all of us who have think we are well educated and and sophisticated and all that. If you had to uh, do all of your banking uh, and manage it for an entire group of people online, calculating interest tables by hand, everything else, enormously complex, uh, time time intensive, um, uh, you know ripe for errors, uh, potential for fraud. And then when you've done all that successfully and you're ready to uh, to go to a bank or some lender and get an external loan, uh, you've got you know paper books with stamps and pencil marks in it and things like that. You're just so, so completely invisible. So digital basically simplifies everything that Sophie talked about. And we're talking in emerging markets. Uh, this is often up to half of the uh, economy is is somewhere in these informal sectors, right? So making you know the 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 entire structure uh, much faster, uh, easier, um, eliminating errors and fraud, uh, giving you a credit history as as Sophie uh, uh, mentioned, uh, and really uh, putting you on a path to financial inclusion. Um, and I think what what Ed talked about uh, as well. I think there's a a really important element that you'll see in some of the better digital solutions uh, in this savings led microfinance sector that really understands our goal of digitization is not to just replicate everything that happens physically. It's to make it so that someone could to take a look at your app. They could say, ah, this is exactly what I do today. It's immediately intuitive. I get it all. Uh, it's just simpler. But also to understand that what we're really trying to do is to, to eliminate all of the low value add tactical stuff that happens today manually uh, and, and just take that off the table, but then enhance the things that actually uh, are intangible, right? So people join these groups, not just for access to capital, but it's an, an incredible social structure, right? Um, it's, a, it's an amazing time to build that bonding. Now you think about what you can do through technology to enhance that sense of belonging, that sense of trust, that sense of cohesiveness. Uh, so we're certainly doing a lot of things that, that kind of Robert uh, mentioned in, in saying design can solve uh, these challenges. If you really and spend time with uh, these groups and, and understand emotional connections, right? Why, what, what satisfaction do you get here? How do you, how do you help you, um, someone achieve their goals? You can do it through gamification, right? You can do it through behavioral nudges. You can do it through uh, uh, creating experience that's fun and engaging uh, at the same time, allowing them to, uh, to be connected, even when things like a global pandemic occur and, and you, and you don't, you can't always meet in person. So I think digitization really, uh, cuts across that entire scope. Thank you, Wes. It's really interesting to hear about some of the innovations you've worked on and the user experience you've built out around your app. And I know we're going to touch on that a little bit more later. So I do want to just shift the focus a little bit more to each of your respective technology stacks, as I know each of you highlighted it in your introductions. But first off, Robert, with you, in working with you and building out your solution, I recall that having a microservices-based architecture was really critical to your approach. Could you explain why you really wanted those separations of the member administration, the group management from the financial processing, et cetera? So. Yeah. What, what we envisioned is why we really wanted to have a microservices architecture that in the end, we are creating the basic infrastructure of first getting people to register and then actually getting access to financial transactions. But in any case, we have to sort of take into account that we're working in an environment which is rather volatile. So for many of our customers, it's the first time actually registering themselves. So we really want to be careful about protecting their data. So for us, we have a stock for member administration, which is basically the, the, all the KYC elements, all the personal information, and that's where people get it. That's where people also get the unique ID and where they get a digital identity. From the digital identity, we actually allow only a couple of transactions, which is not needing a huge core banking solution. So from a cost perspective, but also from a data replication perspective, the microservices architecture just makes it possible. So for us, we have a deposit process, we have a withdrawal process, we have a stock fail deposit meeting process, we have an interest calculation process, but they're all separate microservices. And even for us, we don't calculate interest on a monthly basis. We actually never calculate interest and we only pay out interest when you're actually leaving. Again, saving a lot of transactions, mutations, and actually a lot of handling. The microservices architecture for us also means is that when there's an account, all information connected after that is actually based on the account number. So somebody at our financial office who's doing the financial administration 
cannot connect the dots to which person that money belongs to because there's a unique key going through all the microservices and actually carrying all the information from login to the member administration, validating that's the right person and then doing transaction, being part of a group, is all based on that unique account number. That unique account number is also something we can actually share with the authorities and where we provide KYC information, still not telling who the person is. So the entire microservices architecture makes it possible to do this and at the same time protect somebody's identity, create a very efficient system and be very light on transactions and storing your information. And then again, if we see in the future, and I say, wanna, uh, like, I don't want to get into the payment business because I think there's too many big players in the payment business and I'm in the savings business, but connect to any kind of payment solution in the world because for us, it's just an API. We create a microservice, we connect to it, and we only have to communicate to the account number. Without a microservices architecture, we would have been way too expensive. We have been seeing that we're replicating our data, creating unnecessary risks, probably be open to fraud and corruption and become inflexible. Thank you, Robert. And then Sophie, do you want to expand a bit more? Because I know you've taken some interesting approaches around distributed uh, ledgers and the blockchain to enable better access. And also you're looking at some innovative technologies on the digital ID front. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. And um, I mean, I, I would just expand on the, you know, Robert's case for microservices, which which we fully support because we're, we're doing the same thing. And, you know, and, and just codicil that with the fact that I've built a lot of core banking systems. I used to build banks for a living. And the thing that is that makes them slow and expensive and difficult to maintain and impossible to replace is the fact that they're all full stack, they're not microservices. And that agility that you get through microservices is, is really critical to, to building a stack that is, um, you know, is flexible, is, um, is, it, it's, is suitable for purpose, fit for purpose for this, this market. Um, and then added to that, um, <clears throat> when you're working with blockchain as well, of course, you've got um, the, the added benefits of, of a distributed ledger, which means that you don't have to have any kind of centralized um, storage for your financial data, um, which we find to be extremely valuable. Um, it means that our, our communities can save digital assets without the need for um, any kind of centralized uh, um, infrastructure, which is obviously really, really valuable for them. Um, having said that, we're, you know, we're on the path to, to making it fully distributed. We've still got a certain level of centralization at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of the, the communications and the API side of things, um, you know, again, I fully agree with everything that Robert said and I would add to that that the customers we deal with are very very price sensitive um, and data is a significant price item um, in most of the countries we work in it's proportionally significantly more expensive than, than in the, the, the global north um, and of course um, people have, have much less money um, at their disposal which is also um, a factor which prevents them from adopting mobile money in many cases and so going back to the price point one of the key advantages of using um, a blockchain where on the seller blockchain which is, um, is as I said very cheap to, to run transactions is that you can actually run the transactions at a much lower cost than the cost of mobile money um, and that is a differentiating factor between using mobile money and not using mobile money um, for many people who are very, very poor. Um, so although the blockchain, and I think it was Wes who pointed out that you need to invest to, to get the rewards, or was it Robert? I can't remember. But, um, you know, we've spent a lot on our blockchain back end in order to make it work for this market. Um, it hasn't been straightforward. It's been really, really difficult. But we're, we've got there. We've got asynchronous transactions working now. And, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's a solution that's very scalable because it's very robust. Um, and one of the things I love about blockchain is that, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to build infrastructure for banks in, in Africa and failing because it was impossible. Um, but blockchain gives you the infrastructure for um, places where there is no financial infrastructure. And that, that is why it was so appealing to us um, and, and really why I decided to start, start building Hive Online because, I saw that opportunity for the 66% of, of Africans who don't have access to fin formal financial services and for the vast parts of Africa, which I think frankly are never gonna have full mobile coverage. So it sounds like uh, Ed may be having some audio challenges so maybe we can um, 
as we're coming up to the the last last piece of it. Um, I know we were, we had talked uh, as a set of panelists about uh, uh, Finarac and you know kind of our um, our relative positions on that. I'll I'll actually uh, kick it off. Maybe Sophie and Robert, you can you can jump in there. But um, so Dreamstar Labs uh, prior to uh, founding uh, the company, uh, we actually my co-founder and I ran uh, a small microfinance bank in West Africa. And uh, we're one of the early adopters of, of Mifos uh, and kind of uh, used the, the platform extensively there and created, a, I think, probably one of the first cloud connected, uh, you know, uh, loan uh, processes uh, operating in some very difficult uh, environments. Uh, so we had a, a high appreciation for kind of what would eventually evolve into to Finarac. We built DreamSave uh, just before uh, Mifos actually went into microservices and kind of went through the whole Apache process. So we chose to to build on the Google Cloud Platform as our core infrastructure backend uh, at the time. But um, maybe uh, Sophie, Robert, you could uh, jump in and maybe comment just briefly on sort of how you're how you're using uh, or, or thinking about using the Finrac platform today. I think the, the, the most amazing part is what you're saying as well. Is when I did my first microprojection project in Guatemala in 2009, I went there with a Nokia 6230. I think the iPhone was still not released at that time. Uh, and actually to get the technology right to actually set up a, a pension fund. Um, we basically hacked the payroll system to actually provide the services because it was the only affordable way to do it. Now, if you look what Finorec can do, if you look at the microservices, uh, giving back to the community and actually all the services that were developed for our project are actually uh, available and we're very willing to share because there's nothing unique about having a good savings account. There's nothing unique about having a good savings product. It's unique if you use it and you get people on board, but it's essential that things like Finorec are there simply to make it possible to create those products to actually meet the needs of people. The way you're going to utilize them, the way you're going to expose them, that's, I think, all. Uh, I'm very curious if it looks at that. Yeah, and I, I think what, what I like about, I mean, as I say, I've, I've worked with a lot of core banking systems, and I think what I like about Finaract is that it's it's accessible and obviously microservices, but um, it also offers enough flexibility without offering too much. Um, and one of one of the things that I hate about core banking systems as they evolve is that they get more and more complex because they're offering more and more options, which actually, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the key design principles of design thinking is that you, you know, you don't just slap in another alternative every time somebody wants something different. You know, when I was at City, at one point, we ended up um, with half of our, our trading products were customized and it was just so expensive to run. So, yeah, what I like about it is it's properly thought out. It's microservices and it offers the, the minimum needed for the maximum of available services, um, and which is particularly good for this, 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 this yeah, um, demographic. So, yeah. You, you raise a point there, and so is the, like the one thing when we started off our project is we even tried to get like software from um, software for good uh, initiatives. And I think there's the one percent pledge initiative where you can actually get software with a, at a one percent fee, but then you're still creating a vendor locking issue. And the knowledge and the experience you need to actually get those systems set up are already way out of your budget when you're actually setting up a savings initiative at the lower end of the lower income community. And then at the same time, you need to have very skilled people trained to actually get those services running. And if I look at Finnerat and the technology available, and what we really believe in is that you also want to build up local knowledge and experience in actually running those services, you can do that with an open source community. While if I would use one of the big CRM systems who are part of the 1% one, uh, 1 pledge, I have to send them to, to, to courses online, flying them all over the place, which is just already way out of my budget. I, I, I love people to see all the world, but not to actually follow courses to become good at something while in the end they're going to find a better paying job, which I think is healthy for them. But you, you, you need to have them in your system because that may, local knowledge needs to be ingrained. You need to have the experience, the local developers, because it needs to become from them. It's, it's, we're not in there for the long term from Kodana developed. We want to see it work and then we get out and then people need to run it themselves yeah, because that's the only way I think it's feasible for the long term. Yeah. And Wes, could you speak a little bit to uh, your rationale? Because I know you and Henrik, you built out a very sophisticated microservices based architecture. If you were to do that again today and like look at the leverage more of what Finarec has, what, what suggestions would you provide on 
what Finrac could offer to better support what you have all built out from scratch. Yeah, sure. Well, I think Ed, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it was our decisions were more based on timing to what was you know what was not yet a a full microservices based platform with Finrac. Um, and you know, I think the one of the core um, uh, values you'd look at today is is really that that question of okay, if I don't have to build uh, these these kind of core services, what else can I do with the development time? Because we all have you know large development teams that have put in, put a lot of uh, funds into this. And so for me, it's uh, it's really about uh, what are all of the uh, these additional innovations you have, and it's about it's about time to market and time to revenue, right? Um, and also uh, time to data, right? So I think certainly for Dreamstart Labs, and I'm sure it'd be similar for for Sophie and Robert. You know, just imagine once you have the data from you know hundreds of millions of people in in these emerging markets that you can put to use for them to do things like you know connecting them together um, by uh, giving them better insights into their own. Uh, savings and, and financial patterns, so they can be empowered to make better decisions, right? So it's, to me, it's about it's not it's not about using that data for for some other outside actor to come in. It's basically you know enabling people to make better decisions. Every one of us today in the developed world is able to make better decisions today because we uh, use technology that gives us better data on our own behaviors, our own patterns, uh, and yet that half the world uh, doesn't have that advantage. And so I think really that to me that's advantage. If I can take uh, things that we don't have to rebuild that are in open source that are available as microservices and then apply our our innovation to uh, to that next level bit, then that's going to allow us to to unlock that potential for for people much faster. So really that to me, that's the promise. And Wes, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you all have done around credit scoring and also some of the linkages you're exploring with more formal providers like SACOs and credit unions in the regions you work in? Sure, sure. So, you know, uh, we already talked a little bit about sort of the, the value of uh, giving uh, people in the, in the un, unbanked or informal banking sector uh, credit history. So Dreamstar Labs, uh, partially funded through a grant from Gates Foundation uh, earlier this year, uh, is developing uh, uh, data driven credit scoring for both individual members of these groups as well as um, for the groups themselves. Right. So that both, both they both have a credit identity and looking at uh, the uh, the data from uh, sort, of, sort of obviously the financial tractions internally within a group, as well as the behavioral and uh, demographic uh, uh, factors, and then being able to use those uh, those data points for kind of three things. One is Dreamstar Labs as a provider being able to come in and provide uh, to offer additional uh, supplemental lending to the groups and the members when they need additional capital. Second, uh, working with uh, external lenders and MFI partners. Uh, to allow them to have um, uh, to to offer uh, loans uh, and credit products to uh, half the population that they have really very little access to today at an, an extremely attractive cost, right? Just say, taking out out of the equation all of the loan officers and sort of physical uh, things that happen today, and then third, giving that credit information back to the groups and the members themselves, so that they can make better uh, decisions, that they can understand better how their uh, decisions, and their actions impact their credit worthiness and how they're viewed by external lenders as well. And so I think in terms of your, your question about, you know, making that connection to uh, to to more formal uh, financial sector, uh, one of the things we're currently working on uh, and this with with um, the MIFOS organization as well is uh, sort of connecting our DreamSave digital infrastructure into uh, lending core banking system platforms that are used by microfinance, whether that's in, uh, independent or ones that are built on the uh, the Mifos Finrac uh, platform. So the idea there would be that uh, any MFI who's using that platform to do microfinance loans could connect into um, uh, savings groups that are digitized around the world. We're in 16 countries today uh, and have, by permission of the, of the user, of course, have full line of sight visibility down into the credit score and and, and key data from the group and transfer that all the way back into the lending product that they offer the group. So that again, it's about, about cost effectiveness, it's about efficiency, and it's about building a trust relationship uh, between people that are really off the grid today with sort of any lender uh, that, that could come along and offer them uh, additional financial services products. That's really kind of where we're heading. And, and maybe you, if I can add, in, sorry, the, the perspective of the lenders is, I mean, particularly in areas where, you know, we find out, you know, when the insurgents move in, the financial system moves out. Um, and what we see from lenders is that the, you know, the, the appetite is very high um, because they still recognize that there's a commercial opportunity there, but they, they can't afford the security. It's usually the security that's the big cost. 
Um, and I mean, to your point about integration with with other platforms, um, we've certainly seen with with both payments platforms and core banking platforms um, that support the microfinance industry that there is strong appetite to to work with savings groups and to get this credit scoring. So, I, I mean, it's you know, like you, we're we're in relatively early stages of doing this, but it's it's certainly proving popular, and I think it's I, I think it's a huge opportunity for these populations. Um, and most particularly in in very remote populations and populations which have um, very low um, average incomes as well, because the the logistics for the financial industry, the the unit economics just aren't there. Um, but but when we can provide this this channel, then it, it makes so much difference, and it reduces the risk as well, um, because they can trust the data that comes through the platform better than the data that their agents collect. And maybe I'll just. Uh, because obviously, uh, you know, all of us to some degree are um, are talking about sort of the 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 rural, um, you know, really seri seriously underbanked, um, you know, kind of bottom of pyramid um, folks, and that is certainly that's certainly our kind of a core, our core social passion in in working in this. At the same time, uh, these savings led groups um, are at all sectors of society in emerging markets. Right, you go into to any, you know, Nairobi or in Zambia or, you know, uh, Bangladesh or whatever, you're going to find these, these types of groups there um, with people who would be considered middle class, right? And yet they, they, they love the flexibility. They love the ability to, you know, do it without all the traditional banking fees and, and infrastructure. Uh, there's, there's trust issues with, uh, with financial service providers. So this is a, 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 an attractive market as you move upscale uh, as well. And I think it's like many other markets where uh, people in the, cities will often look down to what's happening in the village and formal sectors and say, why aren't we doing that? Because that may actually be better than some of the traditional things we're doing. So I think this idea of, of taking that savings led approach where you don't just start off with debt, you actually start by building savings, digitizing that, and then creating this super hyper efficient, uh, you know, connection all the way from, you know, the saver into the formal financial sector, should they choose to use it is empowering to the end user, whether you're you know, a middle class person in, in you know, in, in the city or whether you're, you know, just saving pennies uh, in a village somewhere. I, I think that that's also true. Yeah, you're touching on a, an important thing. Eh? Um, microcredit basically was the solution to make financial inclusion possible. And it was all about access and giving people accounts and then providing with, with a loan with the idea that they basically come out of poverty. But there's a huge amount of people who actually can't even get a loan because they don't have an identity or they don't have sufficient uh, information while they did save in groups. Um, I've been through the what is it, 15 years working on this. I've been looking at what was the first actually savings group in the world. I, I know that the entire Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, financial sector is actually based around this group savings model. We call it Broad Funds, uh, the, 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 the Rabobank, which is a huge corporate bank came from it. Um, and it was in, in China, I think, was it a couple of hundred years before Christ? So it's, it, there's a huge information that savings groups are actually the access to finance. What we now also see with microcredit and to the recently published UN white paper on how actually make the next step possible in, in financial inclusion is that they at least see now that there needs to be a balance between credit and savings. Then again, the, the Finnerberg saving solutions on based on microservices for all MFIs and, and the work what you're doing with now is actually... actually creating that access of having an MFI, providing credit, but also providing people with the basic necessity of having a savings account, actually creates the right balance, which you want to see in any kind of financial situation for anyone. Um, anyone who is in a, living in a developed world has a savings account and has a credit account, and they need to be balanced. Otherwise, you're not going to get credit. So if it's about credit scoring, you need to have savings as a basis. Uh, that's also for us where it's about resilience, people need to have savings to cover basic financial shocks, which you will have in your life in any case, no matter what, what is your position. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert. And so thank you for you know connecting back to the past and how deeply savings is ingrained in our financial services worldwide. Perhaps like on our final question, just really talking about what your vision is for the future and what you're looking to do. We can also you know touch upon the question that James posted in there in the chat and really like what these, you know, new players in the financial sector, like what that means as savings groups and savings led financial inclusion, 
provides that digital on-ramp to the more formal sector. So we'll just ask you to do a brief response as we're coming to the end of our session. But maybe each of you spend like 30 seconds to a minute talking about your vision for the future and how it aligns with this question that James posed. I, I like James's question. Eh? Um, I've been working in the financial sector for 25 years and I've learned one thing. It's not a thing I always agree with, but don't ever underestimate the power of money. So why I do see that new platforms and fintech solutions can create a huge user base, um, finance is about trust. And trust is about having, giving people access and sort of being on the background. So actually seeing that, that mobile money operators don't need to become financial institutions and then again going to run into trust issues is going to be a huge challenge. So I wouldn't say that fintechs and blockchain is going to be on itself the new market. And I think actually that the big financial institutions basically going to adopt all the financial players suddenly rising above, uh, 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 being seen now uh, rising, and then they will probably be adopted or uh, integrated. That, that's basically what money does. Uh, I don't say that I'm happy about it, but that's the thing it is. The same thing with all the coins, all the crypto coins. Um, I think within five years, you will basically see that there is an, an e-euro, there's going to be an e-dollar, uh, and every major currency going to have a blockchain coin solution distributed by central banks. And that's also about stability in the economies. Um, Google, Facebook, um, they want to create a market by themselves, but they are much more of a marketplace than they actually want to get into towards the financial institution place. You don't want to be a central bank. It's not a fun job. It's not a fun thing. It's a highly political environment where you're basically always dealing with a sort of Captain Hindsight problem. You only know afterwards what you have done and if it's the right thing and you can actually never do the right thing. Um, so in the end, local banks, community-based, I think they need to be there. Uh, the bottom of the pyramid needs community-based banks because they need to have a local institution where they feel they can trust the people in managing their money. I think, I think we've, we've lost Robert, but I'll, I'll pick up on that. So I'm personally extremely worried about US dollar denominated stable coins. Um, I think that there's an enormous risk of dollarization in less, um, less robust economies. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a risk of loss of currency sovereignty in some African countries. We're already seeing it in Pacific Islands because of the, um, the encroaching E1. Um, and yes, the US, US government and the EU will eventually issue their own CBDCs. But China has been piloting its own CBDC with half a million people already. Um, it's way ahead of the curve. Um, and I think if, if we are, I mean, we still don't know exactly what the model is going to look like. But I think that's that's a potential threat, especially given the, the excessive Chinese investment in Africa today. Um, but my, my real concern, as I said, is dollarization. I mean, if I look at Nigeria, um, investment in, in USDC coin is, is just going up and up. Um, and with the availability and, you know, Robert, Robert pointed out that accessibility is the word. If you, if you have access through your mobile phone to a USD denominated stable coin, which you can use as a store of value and as a means of transaction, that's going to be a huge risk to, um, to a large swathe of, of of African countries, I believe. And I think that central bankers and, and finance ministers are rightly worried about that as well. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I also think that, um, that there is a huge risk that the Facebooks and Googles and everyone else of this world are going to perpetuate the digital divide because there is zero to, to very little motivation to them to reach the populations who are probably never going to be fully connected and not be able to afford um, better devices. and I, I think that there is a huge responsibility to us as a technology community to to make technology available to people, not just people with devices, not just people with good connectivity and not just rich people, but everyone. Um, because if I look at the tech platforms, business models, I don't see a huge motivation for them to do tech for good. And I think that is a huge um, really really scary risk personally um having said that i do think that 
blockchain and other technologies will help us to build the distributed economy and help poor communities and particularly remote communities to to start to overcome this digital divide. So I, I think that there's, there's some of us out there, I think there needs to be more of us. So if you're watching this, come and join us, be part of this community, you're needed. And to, to sort of emphasize that, I think the, the Apple versus Epic battle, uh, where they're talking about the 30% charge fee of being in the App Store. If that becomes the model that you want to put your products on Facebook, but Facebook is going to charge you 30% on top of it, your customers are never going to pay it. Uh, they're not able to pay it. Maybe it's the only way to actually find you and actually pay for it. But that leaves out a huge chunk in people. Like in Angola, there's Facebook Lite. And nobody uses Facebook because it's a hugely crappy product. So that would mean that they can basically cross out 85 to 90% of the people in Angola simply because they don't have access to a platform which wants to become the majority in society. Yeah, uh, that, Facebook uh, Lite is another good thing. Yeah, Facebook Lite's been quite rightly banned in India. And um, I mean, in, so, in some African countries, especially in, in East East Africa, there are as many internet customers as there are Facebook customers, and that worries me a lot. And Wes, do you want to share just a couple of so parting thoughts? A, yeah. a happy note to close off. <laughs> no, the no, question yeah. from James. So, so I, I certainly see some of the same, you know, challenges as well. I, I guess, uh, I guess, I'd say two things that you know at a at a, at a high level. There, one is uh, while I have I share many of the same uh, fears and concerns, I can also tell you from my experience and you know in talking to the big tech giants talking to to banks and things like this, uh, they don't understand uh, 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 huge segments of the market. And I think there's a, a real opportunity here for uh, for distributed finance, for fintech uh, to come in, uh, really understand hundreds of millions of people um, uh, and, and how they actually do uh, work today, completely disrupt that in a positive uh, way. Uh, without interference from the big folks that really, really don't understand uh, how it's working. So me, to me, it's much more about understanding, you know, which are the places where the big folks actually do have a footprint that isn't uh, likely to be intractable, such as, you know, regulatory uh, central bank approval for certain parts or the last mile with kiosks and mobile money vendors and things like that. And then saying, you know, how do I leverage those and bring in uh, technology solutions that actually do understand where, you know, a billion plus people are and and provide things for them that are efficient, that are uh, that solve problems they have and that build on the solutions that they've already figured out, such as savings led microfinance. And so I think there is a, a real opportunity there um, to to be disruptive in a, in a super positive way. By the time the big giants sort of figure out what's happened, uh, then I think it's uh, it's much more favorable for, you know, for the rest of the population. So there's your there's your positive note to end on it. Okay, thank you, Wes. Thank you, cool. Robert. Thank you, Sophie. Like, I know we only scratched the surface on the number of topics we wanted yeah, to get into. To but we are going to be, you know, launching a, a working group to further this discussion and continue to advance the innovations to really serve the, the base of the pyramid that the folks on the panel have been driving. So we welcome everybody to join and attend that. And hopefully we can continue the discussion on that front. So thank you, everybody, for attending and staying a little bit long so we could close out the discussion. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.